Hi, I'm Loretta Bush, President and CEO for Authority Health. And today I have the pleasure of speaking to Dr. Jasmine Gray. Now, Dr. Gray is a recent graduate of the Authority Health Residency Program in Pediatrics, but also she is a classically trained musician and dancer. And later on, we're going to get a chance to talk about that. Dr. Gray, welcome and thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm All excited right. to be here. Great. So, Dr. Gray, you're a pediatrician. Yes and you finished up your residency program here at Authority Health right in the height of COVID-19. Yes. Let's talk about that experience first, how that was for you being a resident in the height of COVID-19, and then kind of transition into what that meant for children. Because early on, people thought, oh, this isn't really going to be a problem for children. So tell us uh, also what you've been seeing there at our pediatric practice. Yes, for sure. When I finished residency, which is just here in June of 2020, um, in the midst of a pandemic, mm -hmm. I was still practicing in the hospital at the wow. time. And I guess you could say March was the month where we say it hit the United States. Um, and I was actually in the pediatric ICU. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like I got the firsthand experience of the first presentation of children. Um, and so I would say no, we weren't quite aware of what was happening even in the adult world, but also in the pediatric world. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, I would say it was more of, uh, we were seeing more adolescents being admitted to the hospital mm -hmm. um, because maybe they're closer to the adult age. Sure. They um, were developing respiratory symptoms. And then as things were transitioning, we saw a lot more kids coming into the hospital with um, a syndrome, I guess you could say. Um, they called it multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Okay. Um, and it mimicked um, what we see a lot, which is Kawasaki's disease, okay. but it affects many organ systems, so not just respiratory, but it can affect um, the cardiac system, the heart, um, the renal system, the kidneys, mm -hmm. um, the skin, um, but that's the multi-system, so more than one organ system, and we were seeing that trend in the hospital, um, and we were kind of looking at it from a um, perspective of, of how we treat Kawasaki, so our infectious disease team was very much on top of it. Okay. Um, so that was that was good. And in the clinic, I felt like we were seeing more patients um, in the general pediatric world um, being afraid to come to the clinic, uh, yes. afraid to get their well visits, mm -hmm. afraid to even come like if their kid has a cough because that's what kids usually come for, mm -hmm. um, a cough or abdominal pain or something. So they were very, very scared um, to come to us for help. Yes. Did you did we see very many children in the peds practice that um, were positive for COVID-19? And then in your hospital experience, did the kids tend to fare better, recover, or was it um, as serious as we were seeing in the adult population? Um, I could say that it's trending into more of I would say the deaths, the mortality from it wasn't as serious as it was in the adult population, sure. um, but there were still um, some consequences that came with it. So we're seeing some um, cardiac, long lasting cardiac effects, long lasting sure. respiratory effects that we'll have to see what happens and we'll mm -hmm. have to follow with these children. Um, for a long time, just yes. as we will with our adult population. Right. So thankfully, I will say, um, it did not hit the pediatric population when it comes to mortality as of yet. Right. Um, but they were still sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and very sick, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what are you telling parents about um, how they can help their children to um, prevent uh, COVID-19. I tell you, it's hard for me with my grandson. My grandson's a thumb sucker. Oh. So trying to tell him, <laughs> we're in the midst of COVID, don't suck your thumb, <laughs> okay? Yes. So what are you telling uh, parents about uh, to, to help them um, talk to their children about prevention? 
so number one prevention, wash your hands. And don't suck your <laughs> so thumb. Don't th <laughs> yes, we try, you know, even when you're not sick, don't suck your thumb. Right, that's right, yes. Um, but teaching them how to properly wash their hands. Mm -hmm. um, we, it's such a basic life skill that we just yes. forgot about, I think, to teach our children mm -hmm. um, and to make sure they're doing it correctly. Yes. And then if you're over the age of two, trying to get them to also wear a mask out in public, I think that yes. two to five year old range, it's hard to keep it on their faces and mm -hmm. we all know that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, being an example of wearing your mask for them and then if they're um, of any age, but yes. particularly, um, right before the school age so from zero to five coming yes. in for your well visits mm -hmm. um, is important. super important because um, we're not doctors aren't just here for when you're sick but we're here to keep you well and that's preventative medicine mm -hmm. um, a lot of what we do in outpatient and so keeping them on schedule for their vaccinations um, yeah. and there's other things we're checking for development sure. um, for these children and also beyond the age of five because they weren't in school yeah. we need to check for their development when it comes to school age children Absolutely. because we rely a lot on our teachers to look right. at our children and be like something isn't fitting properly mm -hmm. um, with with um, he or she's peers yes. um, and we need to That's we as pediatricians point. can see that as yeah. well when they come to the office for their well visits yeah. and parents um, may not pick up on that they don't. as much because yeah. many times parents don't want to think that there's anything going yeah. you know uh, amiss or that yes. their child isn't quite where they need yes. to be but or they don't have the example. They don't know no, um, what their child should be doing at this when age. When you say don't know, and you mentioned washing your hands correctly, <laughs> what does washing your hands correctly mean? Um, so we have the 20-second rule. I tell my kids, everyone's like, saying happy birthday, I tell them to choose their own song <laughs> because, okay. you know, nobody really wants to sing happy birthday every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so choose your own song. There's lots of songs that they love and sing it to yourself. Just 20 seconds, usually the chorus. And a lot of times you brought up the thumb sucking. We forget our thumbs when we're washing our hands. So going on the backs of your hands, looking under your nails Very and then important. getting your thumbs and then kind of going beyond the wrist even a little bit as well yes. um, for 20 seconds. And then um, making sure they're all set up and with your 20 second song and then properly drying your hands afterwards. Along with that, properly using hand sanitizer yes. um, and making sure that you get all surfaces and you let it dry as well. Sounds good. So now what about a vaccine? So uh, all of us were hoping for a vaccine. Yes. Uh, we hope that vaccine comes about soon. Mm -hmm. But then from your conversations with parents and from what you know about the population that you've been serving uh, here in Detroit, Wayne County, yeah. what have people been saying about vaccines? Do you think that um, parents are going to want their children to be vaccinated? What are What is your impression and your thoughts about that? Um, so I'm hopeful for a vaccine. I know it will come um, Do timing of the vaccine. I'm not for sure. I think we're jumping the gun a little bit. I think um, it's going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow and maybe not even next month. It takes mm -hmm. a few phases sure. um, and that's research, that's science that you actually want to happen to make sure that the of vaccine course. is safe. Mm -hmm. um, and so until then, I think one is catching up on or catching up or getting the um, vaccines that we have now, um, including the influenza vaccine when that season hits as well, because that season hits every year. Mm -hmm. um, we know it. So making sure we also get the flu vaccine and when the vaccine is available, sure. um, also getting that vaccine, not just for the children, but for the entire household. For the household. Um, so, you know, that's a perfect uh, segue because August is National Immunization Awareness Month. And so we've always had uh, conditions in the, in the human condition that uh, uh, could make us sick, sick, but we're very fortunate that some of those things are vaccine preventable. Yes. So let's talk about immunizations. People commonly call them vaccines or shots. I know when we were kids, mm -hmm. no kid wanted to get their shots, but uh, as responsible parents, we, you know, they made sure that we got our vaccinations, our shots. So um, 
why don't we talk about that a little bit? Because you, you, you mentioned it a bit that sometimes people are hesitant to get vaccines. Mm -hmm. There may still be myths out there that somehow vaccines are going to make you sick or that they're causing other very um, serious conditions. But um, it's very dangerous if we get like a, a, a resurgence of things like measles and other mm -hmm. um, things that we just really don't see in our population yes. very much. So uh, go ahead and talk about that. Okay, so vaccines or immunizations or shots um, is a, um, basically they help you fight an illness. Mm -hmm. um, so they're made of dead or weakened like germs, I guess you can say, mm -hmm. they're little germs, um, but they're dead, they're not live or they're weakened um, part of the virus and so that our body can recognize it um, so that if you are ever exposed to it, you can fight it and that's what mm -hmm. we call like immunity. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are multiple vaccines that we give to our children starting at birth, literally 24 hours of life um, throughout your entire life. But there's mm -hmm. a schedule and that schedule is scientifically based upon the safest time to yes. give it to a child um, and then also um, safest combinations to give to a child. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots and lots of research that state that this is safe. Um, and everyone is like scared about a couple things. One, oh, this is gonna give me such disease. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that a lot, mostly with the flu vaccine, right. the seasonal flu vaccine. Um, now, what is that about? Let's see if we can try to clear that up. Because mm -hmm. not only for children, but uh, you get adults that say, I got the flu vaccine once yes. and I got the flu. Yes. It gave me the flu. It gave me so the let's, flu. So let's clear that up. <laughs> what is happening Yeah, there? what is happening? So it takes time for you to build immunity, that space and time. And for the flu specifically, it's about 14 days. And most people say, I got it that day after or the day of. Well, your body hasn't got immunity to it. Um, and there's a good analogy I think right now that I can give is basically that vaccine is the mask that we wear every single day. So you're putting on your mask, you've got your vaccine um, so that just in case you go outside and you're exposed to the disease and right now, you know, we're wearing the mask, if we get exposed to COVID-19, um, um, that you're protected yes. against that um, disease. Mm -hmm. um, so, there, it takes time though, immunity for you to build up um, protection against that disease or mm -hmm. virus or bacteria. Um, but if you're exposed, um, if you have that protection, you have a certain percentage of chance of like getting it or not so getting it. So that flu it. vaccine did not give them the flu. No, is what it did not saying. give yeah, them so the simple, flu. It's not Dr. alive. Is saying yes. it's not giving you the flu. It's not a no, live uh, it's virus. It's not a live virus. Now there are some vaccines still yes. that are live viruses. Yes, that right? is true. And people who are immune suppressed mm -hmm. shouldn't be taking live viruses. That is true. Right? So, um, two that we specifically think about are MMR and varicella. Mm -hmm. um, and and measles is a part of the MMR varicella. We think chicken pox. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are children that can't get those vaccines yes. or um, if they are immunosuppressed for some reason. And there's multiple different reasons why that could be. Right. Um, we think of our cancer patients um, as one of them. Yes. Um, or any child that's on long-term steroids. Mm -hmm. um, that can't get them as well. Yes. Um, and so we have to kind of protect those others that can't get it. Um, so now if uh, our listeners want to get uh, vaccinated, they certainly can get uh, their vaccines. And you can see Dr. Gray there at our Pediatrics yes. LLC. Dr. Gray, will you uh, give the address? I know it's in the advance building. Yes. What's the address <laughs> and what's the phone number? Yes, it's the address is 23077 um, Greenfield Road in the advance building, Suite 200. Um, we are there um, and I actually don't have a phone number off the top of my head, okay. but we can probably get that as well. It's 248. Um, something. <laughs> it's on my desk. It's really funny. Okay. Um, 
Um, but you can always give us a call, and there is a website, and the number is there. All right. Um, That's Pediatrics LLC. Yes. She's given the address, and uh, I think that maybe we might have the phone number that's going to show up on the uh, screen underneath yes. us. I'm glad In I'm South not the Field, only one who can't remember phone yes, numbers. No. <laughs> okay, so let's transition then to uh, the um, your background as okay. a dancer <laughs> and as a musician. Yeah. Talk to us about that and how you transitioned from, uh, well, not necessarily transition, you're probably still a musician and a dancer. I still play, yes. But <laughs> how you included then medicine in it. And then, um, you know, one of the things that I know has been of concern to many of us is that, you know, there's a lot of talk about STEM but not as much talk about STEAM, which is the A, which includes the arts. Mm -hmm. And I know that the arts played a big part in yes. your development. And I believe you would say probably played a big part in you becoming a physician and being so successful in that. So that's my very quick plug, not only for STEAM, which I, STEM I love, but also for STEAM, not uh, removing the arts out of our children's uh, educational experience. So yes. talk to us about your background as a dancer, musician, yeah. and, and then <laughs> as how that helped you uh, to become a physician. So um, I went to a creative and performing arts school, SCAPA, um, in Lexington, Kentucky, my hometown. And at the age of four, my mom will say I wanted to play the piano. So she put me in piano lessons. Um, and from then on, I have been a classically trained pianist. Um, and I studied that from fourth grade through 12th grade. Um, it was a two hour a day um, class for me and the opportunity within SCAPA, the School for the Creative and Performing Arts, mm -hmm. was I got to explore other arts as well. Wow. Um, and so I loved tap dancing, I loved jazz, and so my minor was also dance. And then nice. in high school, I joined um, the band, or rather the color guard, because I didn't want to play the xylophone with my <laughs> piano skills. I wanted to dance, and so I joined the color guard, and that was my way of doing both. Um, and that really, really helped me um, understand, um, be exposed to different cultures, um, different activities within um, my growth as an adolescent, as a child, mm -hmm. um, because my mom took me to ballets and she took me to see different pianists that were coming to the city and we went to the opera and I was in so many performing arts plays, um, you know, got to play lead roles. I was in The Wizard of Oz and Sweet. I was in mm -hmm. um, all of these plays um, growing up and it was so much fun um, because you get to, um, you're just exposed to um, literature, to art, to yeah. music, to dance. Mm -hmm. And that's a language that is expressed beyond um, spoken like tongue. And yeah. you, can, you can kind of join communities with the arts. And that really, really helped. Um, now, isn't growth. there some connection between uh, music and the arts yes. and improving <laughs> math skills and other science skills yes. and everything? Um, so like majority of the musicians or pianists, I would say, that um, also were in the training program with me as an adolescent, we all went into medicine or the biomedical sciences with research. And there's a strong connection when it comes to music and the arts and excelling in math and science. Wow. Um, and so I feel like also that was also reflected because we were always a top school when it came to performing uh -huh. um, at tests they never had a problem with us wow. performing at test but we spent so much time on our art skills like I said it was two hours a day where we had yeah. to like practice um, mm -hmm. but it also encouraged it gave us discipline um, it kind of expands your your knowledge your brain yeah. um, connects the left and the right brain absolutely um, and mm -hmm. it definitely helps there's definitely a connection well I know it's worked for you you're an excellent yeah. physician <laughs> So let's just then, uh, it's kind of hard to end on a difficult note, but how can we not talk about um, the racial unrest and what's going on yes. in our country right now? I am very pleased to say, you know, Authority Health, we've taken a, a strong anti-racism uh, stance, zero uh, 
tolerance for, uh, for that in our own organization. Very pleased that our uh, residents, the physicians wanted to take a stand right off the bat uh, mm -hmm. for uh, continued training to be able to eliminate bias in medicine. Mm -hmm. So um, you're at the, the top of your career right now, <laughs> entering in a very interesting time with a global pandemic and also a global racial uh, tension and unrest that, mm -hmm. that hopefully will lead to a better day, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know many of us, our hope is that this will lead to the fact that our kids and our grandkids won't inherit racism. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about what that means for you as yes. a physician, as, as an African-American female mm -hmm. physician, and um, how this all comes into play at this point in your career. Yeah, so it's a time for change, and um, hopefully a lot of the audience is aware of the Michelle Obama podcast that just came out, and they were just speaking about this on the podcast, and it's like, what do we do from here yes. um, as a young um, black female physician? Mm -hmm. um, it's not something new that I've discussed with my patients, specifically as I um, serve a majority African American population. Yes. Um, and so it's not something new where I've talked to the children about um, or talked to the families about some of these difficult conversations that they need to have or have had with their children right. where, when it comes to systemic racism, mm -hmm. um, when it happens in society, in the schools, um, on the street, in the grocery store, it's everywhere, um, and trying to na help them navigate that. Yes. Um, because I feel like um, a lot of us um, have had to navigate that to get to where we are. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's heartwarming when I, when I see the families and the parents and they look at me and they're like, oh, you're, you're a black doctor. Oh, you're a black female doctor. And my, yeah. you know, especially my girls, they're like, well, I want to be a pediatrician and I could tell them, you can do it. I did it. You can yes. do it. Um, or not just a black pediatrician, even though we're the best, <laughs> <laughs> um, but a black doctor yeah. um, nonetheless. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's, it's a time for change. Um, and for our generation or the upcoming generation, there's the millennials, the Gen Zs. I think they're very different. But a lot of like Gen Z generation, they're very open to cultural differences yes. and expressions and acceptance. Um, and we need them to know that one, um, their voices can still be heard in government. There's a lot of distrust right. in that. It's their time to go out and vote as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm giving that transition to my, especially to my um, 18 year olds at the top where I see mm -hmm. um, and to the 17 and below, like this is your chance to speak up and talk to your families about that. Um, I love it. This is their time. Yes. And don't give, don't give up on yeah. government and don't give up on the process. Be yeah. a part of the process. Well, thank you, Dr. Gray. I do want to mention that uh, Dr. Gray and I are not wearing masks because we are yeah. the appropriate <laughs> distance apart because uh, we want uh, everyone to know that wearing your mask is very uh, important yes. as well as social distancing. So as always, I'm Loretta Bush, the president and CEO for Authority Health. Knowledge is indeed power. And August is National Immunization Month. We ask that you consider getting your children and yourselves mm -hmm. vaccinated. This is a time, even though we still are in a COVID environment, the medical facilities have made themselves clean, mm -hmm. safe. The staff is prepared yes. to uh, vaccinate you. And how wonderful it is if we are able to make sure that those vaccine present, uh, preventable conditions yes. don't become a part of our experience again, especially yes. as we uh, go into flu season. Dr. Gray, thank you so much. Thank you. I've really enjoyed talking to you. You as well. Right. <laughs> as Stay always. safe, everybody.